Hey guys, I got a new review for you today and it's the Nikon D500. And many of you are gonna say, well, Lee, why are you reviewing a camera that came out in May? It's, it's old news now. Yes, it's September and yes, I did buy this in May, but I don't wanna be like the other reviewers where they just get like the new camera quick and start, you know, specs, 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 and you know, they take a picture of their bookshelf and go look how sharp it is and how fast it can autofocus. And I don't really wanna do that as a test because um, I want to review this from a photographer's standpoint and you know that's what I do that's my business and I'm not just a YouTube reviewer so I think that the way that I'm going to review this camera is from you know a standpoint that a photographer is going to be using it so I don't want to go over every single spec and every single feature this camera has because that could take forever so I think what I'm going to do is just go over the things that kind of matter the camera's a 20.9 megapixel crop sensor or DX if you're used to Nikon's FX and DX sensor sizes. It has 153 autofocus points and 99 of those are cross type. It has a native ISO of 100 to 51,200. Um, you can expand it up to like 1,640,000 or something like that and uh, all you're going to see is snow and just like garbage. Um, this camera does focus in low light really well. It'll focus up to negative four EV and that's pretty high compared to most cameras that are around the negative three, negative two, stuff like that. So, um, and I have used this in a reception hall during a wedding and I can agree that it does a pretty good job, but it's not perfect. Uh, so yeah, this autofocus system is taken right out of the Nikon D5, which is a full frame, twice as expensive camera as this. So to get that focus system in this camera is pretty awesome. And especially since this is a crop sensor, all those focus points go right across the frame, right across the sensor. This camera has 10 frames per second, high speed continuous shooting. And uh, I guess I can show you right now what that sounds like. I'll just hold it up to the mic here. Anyway, this camera has a buffer of 200 shots. So once you get to 200, you just start over again. It's basically bottomless as far as that's concerned. And it's awesome to see that on a camera. I don't know too many cameras that can do that. And uh, I think that's just raw to the XQD card. I got an XQD card inside this thing. So I just want to show you the loudness between high speed continuous and quiet continuous. This camera has two card slots. You've got XQD and SD and uh, XQD is kind of a weird new format that was invented by Sony. And I think that Sony and Nikon are the only companies using XQD right now. This card I have in here is 400 megabytes a second. So that's pretty fast. Uh, it does have a flip out touch screen. That's uh, 2.35 million dots. And just so you know right now, this screen is actually really incredible. It's, it's super bright. You can shoot outside in the sun. Um, but that's another thing I wouldn't be shooting with live view, it's, it's not the best. I'll, I'll get to that later. But the screen quality, uh, the fact that it's a touch screen is pretty awesome. Uh, if you're used to smartphones, you can pinch and zoom and swipe and stuff like that. And it's pretty nice to have. Uh, the viewfinder is really awesome. It's got 100% coverage and it's nice and big. And uh, it's got the nice circular eye cup that like the uh, D5 and the D810 have. It's kind of like more of the professional look to it. Uh, which I also, I want to get into build quality. It's magnesium uh, with carbon fiber and it's pretty light for the size of it, but it feels like a beast. Like it's built really well. And I think that um, if you ever pick up this camera and get a chance to use it, all the buttons feel nice and everything just feels solid. Uh, I think they really did a really good job on this for this camera. So along with the build quality, you get a mic input and a headphone input as well as HDMI out. And you get clean 4K HDMI out as well as USB 3. Um, the camera also has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC. They, they just came out with SnapBridge for iOS and I'm gonna show you that in a bit, but I don't know if it's user error or what, but I didn't really have the best experience with SnapBridge. And the last thing I really wanna talk about as far as covering the camera is the 4K video. Um, it shoots 4K video at 30 frames per second and 1080p video at 60 frames per second. Um, you get all the frame rates, 30, 24, 25, across the board there. The only issue with 4K video is that you get a pretty big crop on an already cropped camera. So I'll show you that later and show you how much it crops between 1080p to 4K. So shooting in the studio was pretty good with this camera. Um, obviously, like most cameras that are in the studio, you're not going to have a problem with focusing because your models aren't moving too much. You've got good light. We've got off-camera flash. We've got high-speed sync, stuff like that. 
And the camera performed really well. I was just doing this little clothing thing and uh, with a bunch of models. And it was kind of cool because I showed one of the models some of the images that we're shooting and she just naturally went and swiped the screen to the next shot and pinched and zoomed and stuff like that. And a lot of you might not allow your models to touch your cameras, but I, I don't mind. It's not that big of a deal. And uh, it's kind of cool that she just automatically touched the screen because she's used to her, to her iPhone. And uh, it's really nice that they have that feature on this camera. Not a lot of cameras that I shoot with have that. And it's not even something that I really care about having on a camera, but it was just kind of nice to show that. And actually, to be honest, I sometimes forget I even have the touch screen and still use the joystick to uh, switch to the next image and stuff like that. All right, so I just want to show you another photo shoot I did. It was just a portrait session with an old car. And uh, again, the camera, perfect for that kind of stuff. You know, just quick shots, quick shots. You know, you got off-camera flash and stuff like that. And uh, the image quality is really awesome coming out of this camera. The dynamic range is amazing coming out of this camera, especially for a DX sensor. Um, I think these sensors at a point now that you don't even need full frame. Um, it used to be you'd get your full frame for low light and you know high dynamic range, but uh, the sensor in this camera is incredible. So I just want to run through some image samples from this shoot as well as some other images from other random things that I've done with this camera. So you get some really nice focus features on this camera. Um, you get face detection, 3D autofocus, you get your focus points, um, your 25, your 75, I think, and then your 153 points. So what this camera is made for is for sports and wildlife and stuff like that. And that's not something I really shoot. I mostly just got this camera because I wanted a DSLR with 4K video and a really fast autofocus system. I just went to the harbor and shot some seagulls flying around. It's not the coolest nature shots, but you can see how well the high-speed continuous focusing was locking onto the seagull. And this also brings us to sports. I was doing some nighttime shooting of my buddy who plays soccer. Again, it's not something I normally take photos of, but uh, I took it out there with the 70 to 200 2.8. Yeah, it held up pretty well. One thing I noticed is that uh, 3D focusing was kind of awkward. The way 3D focusing works is that right as soon as you lock on the subject, what it tries to do is keep that subject in focus, and you'll see the autofocus points from the viewfinder actually lock on and follow him around. I wouldn't say at night that this is as good a focusing camera as a lot of people say it is, um, especially in a sports environment like that. Um, it's not that it was hunting around, it just wasn't able to really uh, lock on as well as I wanted it to. Maybe it was just the shutter speed I had, maybe the shutter speed wasn't fast enough to catch the action, but um, you know, I got some good images, but I wouldn't call them the best images. And again, I'm not a sports shooter, so if there's issues with these shots, it's probably because I don't necessarily know what I'm doing, but I just wanted to try out the focus system and especially the 3D focus in a situation like that where it's pretty busy with a lot of people around. Um, what I found is that using the single point on continuous high was actually the best and most accurate. So um, I don't know if that's gonna be other people's experiences, but that's what it was for me. talk about live view and the touch screen on the back. Uh, photos with live view, the autofocus is terrible. So slow. And uh, it's not always all that accurate either. If you could see the comparison between live view autofocus and just using the regular autofocus, it's pretty crazy.
I really like the joystick on the back, being able to select your autofocus points, even inside of the optical viewfinder is really awesome. And uh, it's pretty quick in the optical viewfinder. I found it really slow changing focus points on the screen for some reason. So I just want to show some low light test samples at higher ISOs. So starting out at 6400 ISO, it's not too bad, lots of detail. 12,800, it still has lots of detail, it's a little grainy. Uh, 25,600 is pretty grainy, but I'm surprised by how much detail it's retaining. And at 51,200, you can definitely see that the shadows are starting to take a purplish tinge. All right, so the video features of this camera, um, I shot a couple music videos with it so far, and the first music video that you see here, I was using uh, some of the Sony a6300 mixed in with this camera, and I was able to actually grade it really well with the flat profile that they have on this camera. Uh, it's not a log profile, but it's not bad for grading. For some reason, autofocus and live view with this camera just fails really hard. And I don't know if that's all Nikon cameras, but compared to like Sony and uh, Canon's new dual pixel AF, um, Nikon really needs to get on board with the autofocus and live view or autofocus and video for that matter. It's just not really usable in my opinion. Uh, I'll show you some samples here of what I'm talking about. So the autofocus in video is not the best. As you can see here, I've got it set to the center point and it isn't super fast, it does lock on, but it hunts around a while. And then in soccer, it was actually not doing too bad here, it was keeping on them, and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, it just went out of focus for no reason. So the 4K video does take a hit, it, it does have to crop in a bit, it ends up becoming a 2.25 times crop. That's pretty intense, especially if you're trying to get some wide angle shots and you know, I was given some hate towards the Canon 5D Mark IV that's coming out that's going to be getting that 1.74 times crop. Well, this is worse, but the thing is that camera is full frame and this is a crop sensor. So that's kind of disappointing. It's really tough. You know, the only widest lens I have is a Sigma 18 to 35 and, you know, that lens ends up becoming not really all that wide. If you need a really wide angle lens in 4K video, this camera might not be your camera. Um, I don't really want to focus too much on this camera with the 4K video because although I did buy it because it had 4K video, I ended up never really using it because I didn't really like the crop and it's awkward to use. And there's some other things I need to talk to you about that's awkward to use. You don't get focus peaking. You don't really get a light meter to show you what your exposure is. So you just got to kind of guess off the back of the screen and hope that you're not clipping. And uh, yeah, it's not the most useful camera for video. Um, I, I have an external monitor that I was using and the external monitor has some features built in uh, like focus peaking and I was using the focus peaking on the monitor but as far as the video features other than having a nice headphone jack to monitor audio, a mic input and clean HDMI out, um, I wouldn't really recommend this camera for video. It's not bad, it's just not the best. When I say it's not the best, I don't mean that the image quality isn't the best. I just mean that it doesn't have the same features that a lot of other cameras have for video. It's definitely made for photographers. So instead of me talking on and on and on about this camera, I think I have gone over the things that are important enough that you need to know about in order to purchase this camera. You've seen what it's capable of and uh, what it can do and what I think about that. So um, I just want to talk about the things that I really like about this camera and then go over the things I don't really like about this camera. And uh, first, let's talk about ergonomics. This camera feels amazing in the hand. It's not too heavy, uh, it's not too light. I haven't tried it with the battery grip. It obviously is gonna feel a little bit heavier, but um, I've been shooting mirrorless a lot lately and it's kind of nice to come back to a camera this size. It just fits your hand and you know, you really got something in your hand. Uh, you know, you got a machine gun in your hand. <laughs> but uh, the button layout's really nice. I like how they put the ISO button up here on top, kind of like Canon, and you can basically run this camera with one hand. And it's, it's really nice to see them do that. I like the XQD card, it's nice and fast. Um, it would have been nice if it was either dual SD cards or dual XQD cards, and then you wouldn't have to buy two different kind of cards. It's kind of annoying. But uh, it's kind of nice to see that they've future-proofed this camera with XQD. Um, obviously they're a little bit more expensive, but I don't think the cards are more expensive than CFast. 
So obviously with the dual card slots, you get redundancy. You can do backups or you can do split JPEG raw or spillover and stuff like that. Same with every camera that has dual card slots. Obviously it's got nice weather sealing. All the seals look really good and I would not be worried to take this camera through a rainstorm. Um, it's gonna hold up and that's kind of what they've designed it for us to be a beast out in the wilderness. I really like the light up buttons, how you can switch the on off switch here and I've, I've set mine up to actually allow the info screen to come on the back. But being able to have all the buttons light up at night was really nice, especially when I was shooting the soccer, being able to see you know, the different things. But most of the cases, you're gonna know what mode you're in anyway. The touch screen's really nice, being able to swipe back and forth through photos and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, pinch to zoom and stuff like that is really nice to have on a camera. I don't really care about it, but some people might love having that. And uh, have, even having the tilt screen, again, I wouldn't prefer shooting live view on this camera just because the focusing's so slow. Maybe if you're gonna manually focus and use the screen, it's a little bit better for live view, but you're able to get up over your head and obviously down low like that without having to get down on your knees and, and uh, destroy your knees crawling through dirt. So it's nice to have the tilt screen. Is it necessary? Probably not, but I know a lot of people would complain if it's not on it. So they did add it. The joystick for selecting autofocus points is really nice. I notice a lot of cameras are starting to get this now and I think it's a good move for any camera company to put that on there. Um, Sony really needs to get on the board and you know put a joystick on to be able to select autofocus points. Um, it's a really pro feature to have and it's really nice if you don't do focus recompose and you just want to you know keep your camera set and move it over. It's a really nice feature to have. I really love how snappy the autofocus system is in this camera. Although it might not be as hype as everyone says it is, um, it's pretty fast. I would say that it's definitely faster than the Sony a6300, especially for being able to have proper focus and not just saying it's in focus and it's not. Having the 10 frames per second continuous burst with really nice continuous autofocus will make this camera amazing for sports. I don't shoot sports, um, but this camera will be perfect for something like that. You know, you aim it at what you want it to focus on and it's probably gonna lock on and get it the first time. I talked about this already, the dynamic range. Uh, it surprises me every time. Even just trying to pull shadows out of something, it's just like, what? Um, one thing I haven't talked about is the battery life. Uh, it does take one of these bigger batteries that the higher end Nikons use. It's the EN EL15. And I think this is the newer model. I'm not sure if you can use uh, aftermarket batteries. I've heard hit or miss opinions on using aftermarket batteries in this camera, but um, I shot a whole wedding on one battery. I wasn't using this camera 100% of the time, maybe like a 70, 30, but uh, I got 1300 shots out of one battery. They only rated at 1250 or something like that. And I wasn't even on like the red line at 1300 shots. So battery life on this camera is incredible. And if you had a grip and had two batteries in it, you could shoot for two days maybe, I don't know. All right, so startup time on this camera is crazy fast. It doesn't have like any boot up time. It's literally on and you take a picture. And uh, that's why it's made for wilderness. You know, you, you never know when you're just gonna be chilling and you hear like a noise and you like wake up from sleeping and you're in like a tree stand and boom, Bigfoot's down there. You just flip it on. Take a picture like that and you got him. No more of this like fuzzy out of focus. Maybe it's Bigfoot. Maybe it's, maybe it's your grandpa waking up from a weird nap. 4K video is pretty good on this camera. Obviously the quality is really good and it's decent in low light. And uh, yeah, uh, check out the rolling shutter here. It's not that bad. And one other feature I really like is the 4K time-lapse feature and you can set it, it's got an intervalometer built into it. And it'll take pictures and then it'll compose it into a 4K video for you. You can also do time-lapse without uh, the 4K, just getting regular shots. But I just wanna show you a time-lapse I did here at Dundas Square in Toronto. All right, so as you can tell, I really enjoy using this camera, but there's a few things I don't like about it and I'm gonna go over those now. I already talked about autofocus and live view. It's absolute rubbish on this camera. It's not something you're gonna wanna use. If you shoot live view often, this might not be the camera for you unless you wanna use manual focus where you can zoom in, punch in, and stuff like that. And uh, you know, just point to point, it's just not quick enough. Having the touch screen is nice, but it's just not good enough in my opinion. 
And especially when there's moving subjects like out at the soccer field, um, I just, it just wasn't able to do anything that you'd want it to do. Um, you get no focus peaking in video. You don't get any real light meter in video. So it's just kind of awful to try and figure out your exposure just off the back of the screen. You never know if you're clipping or not, but you do at least get a decent screen. So that helps, especially the fact that you can punch in and zoom in and see your focus that way. Um, I already talked about the crop factor. It's not really nice to have if you want to shoot 4K video and go wide with it. So obviously the crop, obviously the crop factor is a, a big hit on this camera and it's unfortunate because it would have been really nice to not have to have that on a camera that's already a crop sensor. All right, so one other thing I want to go through I haven't really talked too much about and it's the iOS app. Uh, it finally just came out for Nikon uh, D500 and the whole iPhone line, iPad line. And so I just want to show you here how it's set up and uh, my experience with it. All right, so you're gonna to need to download the SnapBridge app from the App Store and install it, and then turn your camera on and go to SnapBridge and jump through all these hoops here, then launch SnapBridge. And at this point, I didn't really know what I was supposed to do, so I decided to click this empty camera thing here and it showed up. And I paired it through Bluetooth, and I waited for a bit because I thought it was gonna do something and then I realized I needed to push OK on the camera to make it sync. And once it was connected, I could see that it was connected. It showed the battery life. First thing I did was use the remote photography. And I did some touch to focus and it's pretty laggy. It's pretty delayed uh, compared to other apps I've used. This one's pretty slow. Then I tried changing the settings and obviously I couldn't do that. So I went to the gear and it didn't see any options in there allowing me to change the settings. So I went back out. I'm like, okay, so let's see if I can get some images off this camera. It made me want to connect to Wi-Fi just because there wasn't enough bandwidth. So I said, go. So the camera did create a Wi-Fi hotspot, so I connected to it. And then I went back to SnapBridge and I went to download and it told me that I needed to go back to Wi-Fi again. I just hit no because I thought I was already connected. And then the camera started thinking and I thought it was gonna load some images and it didn't do anything. So I was like, oh, okay. Oh, I think I just need to choose that slot and still nothing loaded. And the card definitely has images on it because you can see on the camera here that they're there. I actually tried this for about 10 to 15 minutes and I could not make images show up on my phone. All right guys, so as you can tell, the iOS app is not that great as far as my experience was. Um, I always thought that, you know, having it always connected with Bluetooth, the SnapBridge would be awesome, but it just doesn't really work as advertised. And I don't know if that's just because the app is so new and they just kind of threw it out rushed. Well, it hasn't been rushed. It's been a long time since they put it out. But it just, to me, didn't work too well. And I don't know, maybe your experience is different, but uh, it's just not a feature that really seems to work as well as it's advertised. All in all, guys, this camera's amazing for sports, wildlife, anything you need speed. And you know, it's like instant on, fast high speed burst, you know, bottomless buffer pretty much. You've got, you know, all the options for high speed sync and stuff like that, as well as the crazy 3D autofocus system. It's, it just works pretty well. And I don't really know if there's much cameras out there that could keep up with it. I know the Nikon D5 has the exact same autofocus system. From other reviews I've seen, this camera seems to be a little bit faster. And obviously with the crop, you get the extra reach. So, you know, your telephoto lenses are gonna give you that crop factor and you're gonna get to go a little bit further. And that works really well for wildlife. Anyway, guys, I hope this review was helpful and you got a little bit more insight into what this camera can do. And I just want to say thanks for watching. And uh, if you like this video, thumbs up. If you dislike this video, thumbs down twice. And I'll see you in the next one.